Doctrine and Devotion is brought to you by Logos Bible Software. And right now, Doc and Devo listeners can get a special offer on the new Logos by visiting logos.com slash doctrine. Find out more in the show. Welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast exploring Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. And I'm Jimmy Fowler, executive pastor at Redeemer Fellowship. Happy uh, Happy Wednesday. Happy that's Wednesday. When, that's when we're recording this. Yep. It drops on a Thursday. Mm-hmm. And we're, we got behind. A little bit. So we're recording this. A little bit this. behind. We got kind of distracted. We got a lot going on. A lot we were going in New on. Zealand, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of church stuff, you know. We busy. Mm-hmm. So um, we're recording this. And then you're going to edit the audio, yep. and then you're going to put it in Dropbox, yep. and then I'm going to take it and write up a blog post, uh, not a blog post, but the show yeah. notes yeah. and the links, and then I'll schedule it to post on all of the everything. Correct. And get it all done tonight. So I want to apologize now yeah. for this not dropping at 7. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or no, midnight. They usually drop at midnight. I want to go ahead and apologize now well, that this will that? post at 9 a.m. This, this is going to post at midnight like always. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You watch. All right. All yeah. right. All There's only right. been a couple of mistakes. Yeah, but how am I going to, you know, I mean, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the support. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, I got it's you. Been a, it's been a challenging week, okay? It has been a challenging been week, a challenging which is week. why I stopped with my joking. Because mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to just stop joking here. You guys, you guys know what it's like. You have those weeks that are really, really hard. Really difficult. It could be like circumstantial. It can be relational. It could be a combination. But whatever it is, you wind up going through really trying situations and you find yourself, you know, Praying more yeah. and and going through these emotions and uh, yeah, I mean it's been it's been one of those weeks for us. Yeah, sleepless. We've been sleepless yeah, not, in St. Charles. Not a lot of not a lot of sleeping. That was okay, good. You're really you're really pleased I'm with not, that. I'm All really right. pleased All right. with I'm that. I'm Billy you're... Crystal. Just for the record, if we're sleepless, no, dang it, no, I'm Tom Hanks. Oh my goodness. No, who is the what other were one? You thinking? I don't know. What were you? The th- same th- chick th- is in the movies. Are you thinking City Slickers? No. What no, you that's Billy Crystal. All right, so I'm thinking. Uh, what we got, were you thinking? The other one. Where okay, he's, so anyways, okay. What, yeah, sleepless in okay. St. Charles. I'm yep. Tom Hanks. No, you're not. Yes. No, I'm Tom no, Hanks. No. Yeah. no, for you messing it up, that's so Billy of you, Billy Crystal. That's who you is. I'm Tom Hanks, all right, all right. and you're not even the same you know show. When I had short hair, when I had hair and short hair, and when I was thin and moody, a lot of people said, "Hey, man, you look just like Billy Crystal." Which was not really a compliment. Yeah, I'm about to say, yeah. how do you how do you recover from that? Is that why you gained weight and shaved my head and, yeah, and got yeah, tattoos? Exactly. Well, I'm like, yeah, I got to fight again. I don't want to be Billy Crystal. <laughs> don't you crystal me? Yeah. So yeah, it's been it's been a rough week, and yeah. uh, looking forward to uh, just hanging out with you tonight, man. Just getting to smoke a cigar and kick back and talk yeah. about what the are we Bible? smoking? I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to say I think we're people both- ask a lot of people ask, and actually Joe got me this. Joe got me a. AJ Fernandez New World. It's the Toro size, the mm-hmm. best size, the one you mm-hmm. should get. Not that Gordo. It's a little bit bigger around and it's not as long and it's more expensive. This one I like better. But yeah, man, I smoke these. Oh, are you smoking the same thing? Yep, I'm smoking the same thing. Now, did you pick these because they're cheap? No, no, but that's one of the reasons they're like my, maybe my favorite cigar right now because they are they're, affordable. They're very affordable. You can get them online probably for six bucks each. So that's just it. It's a, it's a it's a six dollar cigar that I would be like, okay, yeah. I'm okay paying it's that. A, it's it's a, it's. I mean, it's a ten dollar. I would. It tastes like any a good ten dollar cigar that I like. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's as good as just about anything out there until you start getting up into the ligas and whatnot. Yeah, that's the part that annoys me. Like when you're at a cigar lounge and they're they're. Charging like thirteen dollars or fourteen dollars for a nine dollar cigar. Yeah, that's just we, like, we don't come do on. that really. Gosh. Yep. So yeah, we're just kicking back and we got some uh, some questions recently, and one of them uh, got got up a few times was First John chapter two verse two, right? They oh were yeah. Like, hey, why don't you guys deal with that? And we get so many requests now for different topics and subjects. We try to keep track of them all, but we thought, well, this would be fun, and maybe we can do this from time to time. You know, just open up to a passage of scripture, maybe yeah. a particular verse people have yeah. questions about, especially as Calvinists. And you know, this was one that I wrestled with. Um, this was the verse that I used to use to hit everybody when I was a four point Calvinist, because I was always at least a four point Calvinist. When God converted me, He converted mm-hmm. me as essentially as a-, a four point Calvinist. Um, I just never wrestled with those things. I saw them pretty clearly in scripture immediately. Yeah, must be nice. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're you're illuminated like me. It's, uh, you know, it, it, <laughs> but I'm only like a 40 watt. So, you know, I'm not that illuminated. Um, 
but boy, I would use this to beat up everybody that tried to argue with me about it. And I can remember, I can remember my roommate, Tim Woolers, uh, arguing with me about limited atonement. He was arguing for it. And I was saying, dude, propitiation, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Mm-hmm. And I would just repeat it, yell it. We get mad. You'd yell it? Oh, we get we're mad. Oh, don't you make me yell scripture oh, at man. you. Oh, I'll, yep. I'll ye- I yelled it in Latin. I yelled it in Greek. No, not really. So, I was about to say, that was, that was a pretty braggy thing to say got, right no, there. I, I, did, I, I, I still don't know Latin, um, and I barely know Greek anymore. So I went home on break. It was Christmas break, freshman year. I went home, and I spent the whole Christmas break studying the atonement, studying every passage of Scripture that I could okay. that dealt with the death of Christ, the cross, blood, uh, sacrifice, Old Testament, New Testament. I, I, I did everything that I could to study it. And to I, prove him wrong. To prove him wrong, and I – Prove myself wrong. <laughs> I came out on the other side as a as a, as a reluctant now, five point go, Calvinist now, at that did point. Did you go repent, apologize? Oh yeah, yeah. I was and, like, yes, thank I, him, I, thank you that right. dear brother. You right for pointing out those areas. <laughs> yep. I was yeah. like, dang man, you were right. Mm. I was wrong again, again. Yeah, that sounds like Joe. So it's it's pretty often. So uh, why don't we go ahead and take a look, uh, Jimmy? You want to read? Uh, yeah, I'll do, Yeah, I'll do one through six. All right, all right. First uh, John chapter two verses one to six. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. All right. It's a great passage. It's a great book. And verse 2 is the one that, you know, a lot of people think is the aha, the I gotcha verse for the Calvinists because it says that Jesus is the propitiation. And it doesn't just say that he's a propitiation for the sins of the world. He says, not for ours only. Yeah. And they say that means Christians, but also for the sins of the whole world. That means everybody without distinction. Mm. So we got you. Limited atonement is nonsense. Yeah. They don't like it or particular four redemption. <laughs> you got to go four pointer and then they'll try to whittle us down to one and then none. Um, but really what we have to deal with here is we have to deal with that word, right? Propitiation. Uh, the, Greek okay. word, the Greek word halasmas. Yep. Um, yep. And Zootype. Yep. So there's – thank you. Uh, there is – Diff- some people disagree on how to interpret it. Like guys like C.H. Dodd went with a with an expiation only view, where it has nothing to do with satisfying the wrath of God. Um, but certainly, traditionally, historically, uh, and the scholars that I tend to read all argue that that word speaks fundamentally about mm-hmm. satisfaction. Yeah. So why don't you, as you talk, you use that word exp- uh, expiation, right? Why don't you go ahead and clarify that for our listeners that may not have gone through. Uh, so the classes that that you first grade through. Sunday school, yeah. Okay, yeah, stop. All it. right, you why don't dummies. Go ahead and look, oh. Why don't you go ahead and look back to okay. you know the Old Testament? Use use some of the the things there to go ahead and and let people know. Well, you seem prepared. Why don't you do it? I'm yeah. not prepared. Oh. I just I just, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> hence, hence why I said. But I the, know the, what we're talking about. But the, yeah, I'll the let basic, you do the expiation. The, the, yeah. the basic idea here um, behind expiation. Right is that it is the removal of your sins. Your sins are are taken away, taken away from you. Um, whereas propitiation is the idea of the, uh, a satisfaction for sins through a sacrifice. More specifically, that the wrath of God, the just anger of God, is satisfied by the sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So you know, in the Old Testament, we have uh, the, the sacrifice, the offering. Uh, that's you know, the, the, the blood from the offering that's sprinkled on the mercy seat, yep. propitiation. You have the scapegoat that's right. uh, running off into the wilderness, yep. having transferred the sins to the scapegoat. And now the, the scapegoat and our sins, uh, metaphorically or representat- representatively. Yeah, the high priest would, would lay hands upon right? the head. Yep. And then, then they send that out and their sins are expiated. That's, that's the picture uh, in the debate between how to interpret this word. But the ESV, the NASB, they rightly translate this propitiation. Other translations like the CSB and the NIV translate it atoning, atoning sacrifice, sacrifice yeah. which is pretty vague. It doesn't really which communicate. Which is, I think, one of our, one of our concerns when, right. we, when we you know first saw the CSB, right, was, was taking out some of that theological language. Yeah, they used to have it in there. Yeah. The HCSB. Now it's just CSB. Mm. 
Um, Give us the H back. Yeah, I want the, the H. Boat. Yeah, the, oh, the H was for a last That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? <laughs> we're so self satisfied. Um, okay, so um, we're going to argue that, uh, and again, we're we're relying on on Greek scholars to to really make this yeah, point. People, but people smarter than us. We we do see it as propitiation. It is the satisfaction. The quenching of God's just anger against sin. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's not a possibility. It's not a possible propitiation. He is the propitiation. When, Jimmy, when did that propitiation happen? Uh, actually, well, ro yeah, on the cross, Romans 3, 25, whom God put forward as propitiation by his blood what? to be received by faith. Oh. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. That's good. That's so good. So... Propitiation was accomplished on the cross. Yes. Um, so the question is, for whom? And so it mm. says he is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Yes. All so, right. So everyone, uh, without question, uh, he died for their sins, whether they – they believe, believe or in not. him or not, yeah. you know. And therefore, since their sins have been propitiated, satisfied, mm -hmm. quenched, there's no wrath. No wrath for so them. everybody's going to heaven. That's right. There you go. That's All right, done. Done. Yeah. Uh, if you, uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter <laughs> at <Doc Udipo. laughs> So, obviously, we're not going to take that route. No. Um, so, interpreting this, our sins and the world, um, that has to be done in light of context. It has to be done – the way you interpret these words has to be done not only in light of context but also in light of the theological point that John is making. Yeah, and, and how he's used it exactly. later on within the same – In this in, epistle? In, but in this epistle but also in, in John. the Johannine literature. Ooh, biblical theology, boy. I, yeah, well, I, I did something I know, with my time. I like that. I think that. So – when it comes to the idea of world, um, that word is used by John in a bunch of different ways, right? Sometimes it means just like the created order, the whole creation itself, right? Yeah. What are some other ways? What's one that you think of that you – Yeah, I mean I think of um, almost like regional, territorial, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, uh, the – not the municipal, the municipal, but the geographical area right. surrounding them at that time. Yeah, the general, the public. known world. Yeah, the known world. Yep. Right. It can be that. It can be the known world. Uh, it can be the general public. Yep. Um, it can just mean like humanity, like yeah. the it itself. Like you see that in in John one ten. I mean, there's a, we have verses for all this stuff, but we're mm. just trying to simplify this here. It can be the philosophical system. Right, like the, what the world, the world system. If anyone loves the world, right, um, it, like the world, sometimes represents um, a well, you could say an organized or a chaotic, but almost like a a, a living system that opposes God. Mm. Right, it's this anti-Christ principle that um, that we see in the world as yeah. it is, you know, ruled by the God of this age. Yeah, and he's also got the uh, uh, the pumpkin view that the world is a vampire. Okay. Now that pumpkin might yeah, be smashed. Yeah, I know. No, not, not everybody's going to get that. I liked it, though. I got, <laughs> How many fist bumps are we going to do in this episode? <laughs> Sitting here in our undershirts. <laughs> no, don't tell people that. Why, we, don't tell why people did we that. Sit, why did we got in here? We took off our shirts, and now we're in our undershirts. Why is that? <laughs> I sent a photo of you to your wife. I know. She sent me a, uh, she sent me a, a, a response. What is, what, is, what is it? Oh, hold on. But yeah. So I think it was because it was hot, and we both, you know, the, the meeting was over. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then we just decided that's a response. <laughs> <laughs> we, might, we might put that in the show we notes. We'll see. Screenshot oh. that. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, the world is a vampire. All right. So, uh, also, um, like when Jesus is praying in John 17, right? Um, he refers to the world. Yeah. And there he's specifically referring to the world of unchristians, right? Of yeah. non believers. Because he says, I'm praying, I'm not praying for the world, he says in John 17. I am not praying for the world. I'm only praying for those that you have given me. Yep. That is, I'm praying for believers in the world. So, there the world means. Those who will never believe, the non-Christians. Yeah. So John uses it in different ways. So context and theological um, imperative or point really has to be what we're what we're looking at here. Now, you can also say that John uses – and John does this a lot. And this is where I think John is going with this. Yeah. John is constantly pushing on the grace of God, the kingdom of God, the gospel of God mm -hmm. being for the world, meaning not just Jews, but Jews and Gentiles, mm. right? So it's that, it's that way of talking about all kinds of people, if not every single individual, 
are we talking about like groups? Like are you talking about like people groups or are that would to- be a part of it? But yeah. it, 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 you know, a lot of people talk about it in terms of when John says the word world here, does he mean all without exception or all without distinction? distinction yeah. yeah. And so all without exception would be every individual to constitute the human race, you know, from Adam until the end. Mm. All without distinction would mean all kinds of people, Jew, Gentile, slave, free. Mm. Now, and that really is a New Testament emphasis, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that certainly is one of John's emphases. So all without distinction really is. And let me give you an example here, if I can bring it up in my uh, in my Lagos Bible software. Okay. So an example of this is in John chapter 12. Um, listen, uh, listen to this. All right. So it says um, – Verse 17 in John chapter 12, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Mm. Really? The, the whole, whole world. world. Yeah. No. Uh, every individual without exception or people without distinction. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. All right. So all kinds of people, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, all kinds of people. So the word world, like world means world. I hear this all the time from our middle. World means world. All means all. All right. Well, that's okay. I'm sorry. That's a little juvenile. It, 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 you have to. Okay. So you still have to define your terms. You have to define yeah. those words. So every individual. Without ex- without exception, or every individual, like individuals without mm-hmm. distinction. So, and that and that's really how we, we see this coming into play here. So, John's emphasis on the on on world as Jew and Gentile, plus the theological implications, leads us to believe that um, that this has to mean that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Mm-hmm. These Jewish first century Christians, yeah. but not just for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world, Jew and Gentile. Yeah. Now there's debate, who is the audience of John? But again, context, usage of the word, theological point drives me to that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jimmy, it, we've, we've already talked about this, but just explain it to people. If Jesus is the propitiation for somebody, mm-hmm. what is the eternal state of that person guaranteed to be? That's, yeah, salvation. Why? Uh, because Jesus' sacrifice is su- all sufficient, right? So it's not to satisfy the wrath of God. Yeah. yeah. So there is no more wrath. There is nothing left. Yeah. And some people would say, like, well, no, Jesus died for all their sins. The sin that sends them to hell is unbelief. It's their unbelief. But that's a sin. Yeah. And if so it's that's a sin, not all sin. It's it would be atoned for. We're really stuck. Now, listen, I I can be all for universalism. I, I could That'd be, be easy. Oh. Be, That'd be so, so much nice. Wouldn't that be easy? Not oh, to talk about hell. No. Just all you could do is the love thing. Just talk about love. Yeah. God's love and grace and love mercy. wins, bro. <laughs> so um yeah. So I'm I'm I, I look. If you want to make a case for universalism, I think you have a hard time with squaring that with the rest of scripture, but that has to be the implication of these of this verse and as as we read it. Yeah. So there's no other way around it. You know, John, the, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say John Owen. Uh, in volume six of his works, uh, The Death of Death and in The Death of Christ, he um, he makes this point about, about Christ's sacrifice. And if Christ died, he argues, as a propitiation for sins, it means that either Jesus died for all of the sins of all men or all of the sins of some men or some of the sins of all men. Those are the options, mm. J- Owen argues. So if he died for all of the sins of all men, then all men are free from sin, yep. Owen argues, and everybody's going to heaven. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good news, I suppose. Yeah. If, so what's, if the, what's the point then of missions? Uh, probably to get people to, to – give money towards the church? No, well, the, of course. Um, I think people would say, though, listen, we still believe in missions because it's better for them to be converted now, to know the Lord, to be freed from the shackles of sin in this present life. They can make reasons, okay. make up, yeah, come up with good reasons for it. Um or he died for all of the sins of some men, which is what we're arguing, right? Mm-hmm. That Jesus died for the elect. So therefore, those that God had given to Jesus, those that God had chosen to save, will be saved because Christ died for them yeah. effectively. Um, or three, uh, Jesus died for some of the sins of all men in which men still have to answer for their sins, Owen says. Yeah. And that means we're all going to hell. Yeah, we're all doomed. Right. So the this is – it's not – see, I don't feel like it's – 
overly complicated. We're not playing a bunch of Greek games here. We're, no. Um, and, and sometimes, like, there is another passage that we can talk about in Peter where, like, it's the Greek that really helps people to kind of sort through it more. But in this, it's just how does John typically use the word? Yeah. Um, what is the point that he's making? His point is that this, the God's wrath is satisfied by Christ's sacrifice. Yeah. If that's the case, well, that's the basis of our entrance into heaven. Yeah. So if that's the case, then we're, we're in. So it, it cannot mean what people want it to mean. And so it's it's not just that it doesn't fit within my logic. It's that it doesn't fit within the point that he's making, the book. Mm-hmm. It doesn't fit within the scope of scripture. It doesn't fit within the usage of the word. And so, Joe, I mean, one of the things that I know you and I value is being able to study God's word mm-hmm. and to be able to draw from other resources and even languages, right? Like you talk about Greek and Hebrew and not all of us can be like a uh, like a Dr. James White, right? Right. Like that. Or even uh, Pastor Tom Schmidt, right? These right. guys, like they, they know. Tom Schmidt's one of our church planters. Yeah, they know the languages. There's a lot of other faithful brothers out there. That, Joe Thorne. That know, that <laughs> know the languages. But you know what? Truth be told, I, I you know, 90-something percent of us don't. Right. Right? Even and those so- of us that took a bunch of Greek still really don't know Greek. We, exactly. we, we have to rely on all the commentaries and exactly. all the tools. Or even in Lagos, where uh, that could help you with stuff involving Greek and Hebrew. Right. And so uh, Lagos Bible Software, they just released their brand new uh, acclaimed Bible software. And it makes this like step-by-step easier for in-depth Bible study, even taking a passage like ours, like we're talking about here, yeah. 1 John 2, 2, and being able to go through and study, look at what are some of the other texts that are associated with it. Where was this text cited by as far as other other points of scripture or even other commentaries or writers like John Owen or Jonathan mm-hmm. Edwards? And so being able to take a look uh, uh, in-depth is, is really really crucial. So you just choose the passage and the type of study that you want to do, whether it's devotions, inductive Bible study, and for some of us, sermon prep. And it'll help give you kind of a step-by-step and not saying you need a step-by-step, but at least it, it helps guide those that are still learning and, and yeah. you know, to learning how to study. It's like, listen, the, it, the it's process like, of you've, study. you've got a Bible study coach there saying, That's all right, right, here's what you do. All right, I'm going to break it down for you. Yeah. And they give you, you go, start with this, start here, make these connections. That's right. And it helps you learn as you're doing the work. So one of the things I've always loved about Lagos is, is is the the resources and being able to take a passage and take a uh, an in depth look uh, at what some of the other commentaries are saying, where else it's used, um, and even as we just started learning about the cited by feature has been oh. been really good. I've, cited I've by. That. That's been really good. I, you know, I finally learned how to do the collections. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah I finally learned uh, how to do it. It's got, it's not, uh, well, we'll get, we'll get to do it later. We'll yeah. get into it later. So, but right now, Dr. Devotion listeners can get a special offer on the new Logos mm-hmm. by visiting logos.com slash doctrine. And I believe it was what, 10% off. If you're off. buying it new for the first time, you get 10% off the whole thing. If you're upgrading, it's 25% off. 25% that's, off. That's a almost off. free. Almost free. It's 25% off. Yeah, that's a lot. It's a quarter off. Okay, well, that's that's a lot, man. It's like almost free. <laughs> so check it out, logos.com slash doctrine. They've got lots of great resources, video tutorials. Make sure you uh, uh, make use of those. All right, Jimmy. So we're talking about the doctrine of, of, of Christ's atonement, the scope of it. You know, people call it limited atonement or particular redemption. Who cares? I, I was what about like the phraseology? Is that what you're talking about? About the whole doctrine. Like, look, I, I had a, I was sitting down. I won't mention his name, but it was James McDonald. And Stop. Um, <laughs> he, 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 one time he was like, he's like, all you reform guys, you love to talk about unconditional, no, limited atonement. You guys always want to talk about limited yeah, atonement. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, no, we don't. What are you talking about? Like, I, I definitely don't. I don't know anybody that really is dying to talk about limited yeah, atonement. Well, yeah, well, a lot of the cage stages are, yeah. May, uh, probably. Maybe that's yeah. what he was talking about. That's what he was like, talking about. But like, in the reformed world, like, no, it, not really. And and then he started throwing some verses at me, and so I started answering. He goes, see? <laughs> I'm like, well, yo, yo, you brought it up, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it if you brought it up. So we had, this, we had this long conversation about it. So, but in the end, does it really matter? Who cares? Like, unlimited atonement. These aren't universalists. So Jesus died for everybody. What's why does it matter? What what do you care? Why why what what is this doctrine supposed to do in us? This idea of particular redemption. Well, I mean, I think it it should elicit uh, this sense of awe and humility, right? This sense of uh, here, our gracious God um, has has chosen us and has saved us. And it talks about it later, later in other places in scripture where be found before the foundations of the earth, right? Mm-hmm. Before before anything, God picked and 
he picked us, yeah. right? And that to me is is incredibly awe inspiring. Yeah, and it's I think it it produces a different kind of humility and awe knowing that Christ died specifically for you by name, mm-hmm. in a way that he did not die for other people. Like he he died for the church, right? And this is what Jesus says: like I lay my I lay my down I lay my life down for my sheep. Yeah. In the context of there are some who are not my sheep. Mm-hmm. You know, Paul says that Christ laid down his life for the church. Yeah. So um, you know, this idea is is important because it is not a general atonement that Jesus made. Yeah. He specifically died for his people. He says those whom the Father had given me. And it, it's like um, it's like when the sacrifices were being made in Israel by the priests were those made for the world. Or were those made for Israel? Israel. Yeah. That's how it works. The high yeah. priest makes a sacrifice for the people of God. Yeah. And so Jesus did the same thing. And when I, so that, that Christmas break, when I finally came to this conclusion, it was one of those rare times when um, my cheeks got a little wet, a little, a little Aww. weird in there. I didn't like that. Did mm. you really cry? <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't cry. <laughs> I definitely didn't cry. Did you pout? But uh, no, I didn't pout. Pouting is different. Um, but I, I feel like you pouted and then cried. No, pouting. Yeah, I probably pouted because I was wrong. Yeah, yeah. And then you cried. And then, but then now, how much cry. crying? Like when you say like how wet? There might have been a drop under the was, under the journal. So it was that much. But there was no like sobbing. I wasn't like sobbing. Are I wasn't you breathing heavy. Why are you front with us? Are you so- were no, you sobbing? It's okay, not, Joe. No, that's a, that's doesn't beautiful. Matter. And the point is, Aww, is sobbing that it had, Joe. So, <laughs> it, it had an Hashtag impact. Sobbing on Joe. Me. It had an impact on me because like, Christ actually died for me. Yeah. And you know, like that. So this really relates to assurance as well. My assurance is not in my yes. behavior, not in my performance, not even in the strength of my faith. But I do believe. And the one in whom I believe died for me. That's a part of faith, right? I believe Christ died for me. He was. I, I remember that moment. I remember the moment that it, like, it crystallized in my mind when I went from not believing to believing. And one of the things I believed was, "Whoa, Christ died for me. I'm forgiven." And I, yeah. I believed all at once. Bang! And it was, it was just this profound sense of of awe, of humility, yeah. of peace. And it just goes deeper when you dig into this idea of particular redemption. Yeah, and it should also, though, give you a greater love, respect, uh, treatment of the bride of Christ, right? Yeah. That, that Christ died for his bride, that your brothers and sisters in Christ, and I'm not saying this means, like, devalue those outside the church that's not what i'm what i'm getting at but i'm saying you should though have a have a greater love and compassion and grace and and um relationship right with your with your brothers and sisters and so i think you should that it should draw us close this should unify us it's really good that's a really good point jimmy because i think a lot of us just think like oh it's the church we love each other we're supposed to love each other because we're members of the same church but the the reason is because what you said Christ died for us to unite us, yeah. to make us one. Yeah, and not just here, but then globally, right? Right. Then we got to be looking at how's it going for our brothers and sisters in in China, right? You know, how's it going for the church in Italy, right? Or anything like that, like that. So it's it's it shouldn't it should there should be a greater uh, greater show and swell of unity mm. within the local church. But that should spread out. That should yeah. spread out to uh, uh, the region and even. To the world, right? right? Totally. And, and to me, we need to be closer when we're talking about these things. But then also, finally, if I could, uh, I don't know if you have another one, but I got another one. I got 10 more. Go ahead. Okay. Well, you want to go ahead and give your 10? I'll give no, my one. I, I got to think of them now. Okay. There you go. Um, this then should uh, propel us towards mission, mm-hmm. right? That we know that there are others because uh, Jesus talks about that, yep. right? Some of them are, that are not here, that are not of this fold, but are of the fold, right? Yep. Um, that we should be compelled to missions, mm-hmm. to be making disciples as disciples, to be reaching out uh, to our neighbors and to be prioritizing uh, sharing the gospel or proclaiming the gospel uh, or you util- like, Enabling others, right? Encouraging others uh, and supplying the tools and resources and finances. Are you looking uh, for the word equipping? Equipping. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can see you fumbling around. I know. I'm sorry. I know I'm, I'm, I'm processing out loud <laughs> as they're as they are going to yeah. the ends of the earth and 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 proclaiming this gospel. It's a theological truth. It is doctrine that unites us, and it's not doctrine just abstracted. It's doctrine as an explanation of who Christ is and what he actually did, right? That's what yeah. unites us, that what propels us on mission. Speaking about that, maybe we can wrap it up with this. 
I get asked sometimes, well, how do you do evangelism then? If you believe yeah, in really limited good. atonement, what do you say to people? Yeah, that always annoys me. It's like, like well, how, how, just, you, you, just you, because we believe in limited atonement means we don't believe in evangelism. Well, even if they, even if they're going to take us for, at our word and, um, and believe us when we say we do it, sometimes they get the, sometimes they ask, oh, so, but how do you do it? Like, yeah. you, you don't, you, you can't say you should believe in Jesus. He died for your sins. So what do you say? Mm. And I actually got this a lot, especially in Bible college, because that was the only way the gospel was ever really explained as an evangelistic uh, explanation, right? Yeah. Christ died for you. You should believe in him. Christ died for your sins so that you could be forgiven. So believe in him and receive that. So what do you say? So, yeah, you're, you're already presuming upon the, uh, the atoning sacrifice of Christ in their life. Yes. And so I never say that. I never say that. So people ask, what do you say? Um, here's what I say. Well, first of all, there's a variety of ways to actually present the gospel. Um, and maybe we could do an episode on that. Like I would love that. Yeah. That would be really yeah. good. We should do it like not just with, you know, with adults, but how do you present the yeah. gospel to teens and youth and yeah. kids? Various right? ages and various approaches really and various good. ways. All right. But for this, in light of the cross, um, what I say is that Christ died for sinners like you. Mm. Christ died for sinners. I use the language of scripture. So when I'm talking to the church, I say Christ died for us. When we're having the Lord's Supper, I tell them, as you eat, as you drink, remember, no, Christ died for you. I'll say that just like Paul does when he talks to the church. Yeah. But and then I'm, we fence the table. <laughs> we fence that table. We say, like, you ain't getting any. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta have Jesus before you can have the that's bread right. and, the, and the wine. Mm. So um, so that's what I say. I say, like, listen, uh, you know, you are a, a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're we're justly condemned by God's wrath. We deserve death and hell. Um, we, we have no ground to stand on before God. Our best works, our best morality, our, our best our personal reformation, our best religious practices, all of that stuff is corrupted with sin. It's tainted by false motives or, du or duplicity. And so we stand condemned. That sin should condemn us, but Jesus stood in the place of sinners. He took the condemnation that sinners deserved and he died for sinners just like you. That's that's how you present it. Mm. So now they know, like oh, they, they can start to get it. I'm not saying that Jesus did die for them. I wouldn't know that. I wouldn't presume upon it. And, no. But that is unthinkable for some people. Like, I, how could you not say it? Because that's the only way it's ever been said to them. It's the only yeah. way they've ever seen. I don't know. I think that, oops, just burned myself. I think that, if we're going to be a people who are serious about evangelism, um, especially as Calvinists, yeah, I really think that we should be leading the charge. And by and large, I don't think we are. No, I, I agree. I, that, that's the one thing I agree with, like our our mini and our traditional brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? Is uh, that we're not really we're not really showing it. Right? Like we're not really doing a good job of that outreach. But I would also right. say. But neither and are they. The, yeah, within the SBC, neither are they. Yeah. Right? The statistics show that nobody's really doing evangelism. Exactly. I'd say that that's a weak area for all of us. But 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 see, here's the thing. I don't think we have an excuse as Calvinists at all. We exactly listen. Hey, Calvinists, you got all that theology, you got all that mm -hmm. knowledge. If it's not burdening you to tell others about Jesus, your knowledge is junk. It's garbage. It's yeah. garbage theology. If it's not moving, uh, and I'm talking to myself here too. If our knowledge of Christ, if if your understanding of divine election and uh, limited atonement and and uh, uh, irresistible grace, if, if that stuff doesn't make you want to tell everybody who will listen to you about Jesus with the hope that God will do what only he can do, convert, mm -hmm. then you're doing it wrong. You're thinking it wrong. Yeah. So I think a lot of us uh, should be pushing ourselves and should be pushing each other. And really, uh, I know this, uh, we'll see what people think. I really do believe that it needs to be modeled by pastors. You know, pastors are called yeah. to do the work of an evangelist, right? Out of yeah. Timothy. Yep. It's supposed to do the work of an evangelist. Now, I think a lot of pastors think, well, I do the work of an evangelist in the pulpit, which is true. Sure. That's one way. But I do not believe that that is all you're supposed to be doing. You should be in the world talking to other people about Jesus mm -hmm. uh, during the day, on the weekends, uh, when you're out for dinner. And you see people doing this. Like, like I know guys, like Ed Stetzer's a friend of ours. Yeah. Homeboy's always telling people about Jesus. Yeah. Cab driver, waiter, he doesn't care. He's telling everybody. Mm -hmm. And he's not like this reformed guy or anything. Um, but, you know, he's, he's a smart guy. He's a thoughtful guy. But he's the guy that's always doing it. We need... We need to be that way. Yeah. We should really look for those opportunities. Our, our theology. So I think pastors have unfortunately 
um, allowed, we've allowed ourselves to get so busy with ministry that we wind up not doing the work of evangelist too often. I agree. But if we will do the work of evangelism, we will model it and then share those stories with our people from the pulpit and our yeah, counseling, not in an coaching. Arrogant way. It's no, a, yeah. say, here's what happened. Here's what happened. Here's, yeah. what happened. here's, here's where should, it went well. Here's where it really here, failed. Oh man, I said this so wrong the other yeah. day. It was so awful. But you know what? I know God can use it. Yeah. You know, Actually, we were talking about that with somebody just even in New Zealand. In New Zealand right? Yeah. Yeah. Just this idea. This this individual felt like. Um, you know, that they were sharing and they, they'd have to go back and be like, ah, I said it wrong, you know, yeah. kind of a thing. It's this, like, well, this sweet lady, right? I don't even, I don't, I don't know how long she's been a Christian, but she's a serious Christian girl. Tell yep. everybody about Jesus. And she's always like feeling bad about how she blows it. Yeah. And she's like, I just didn't do it right. It didn't do it good. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it's, we're, we're what you tell encouraged. What, what, the spirit is, is, is able, <laughs> like, like trust of the spirit. The spirit will work even in our shortcomings. Yeah. Praise God for that because. We all need the spirit's help. Like, I, I'd rather it be the spirit's work than mine. I know that I know that God can use her screwed up presentation of the gospel because He uses my screwed up presentation of the mm -hmm. gospel, just like He used John Wesley and George Whitfield. Everybody blows it. Like, nobody, nobody's gonna perfectly do it. And, and thankfully, our our hope is that God will use the word, Amen, to convert the lost man. That's right. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Doc and Devo or on Facebook slash Dr. Devotion. You can head on the website, drdevotion.com. There you can contact us. You can sign up for the email blast or hit up the store, jofostore.com. J-O-F-O. -O. And grab some gear. Also, guys, uh, Dr. Devotion Conference. Doc and Devo 2019. Early, Early bird. bird is ending soon. Yeah, you got to get in on that. You got to get, you need to go over to drdevotion.com slash conference. And uh, go get registered while you can. Save that money. Listen, if enough of you register, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk Jimmy. No, you're not. I'm gonna talk Jimmy into something. No, you're not. I'm gonna talk Jimmy into putting in the swag bag. Temporary tattoos. Temporary tattoos. Doctrine devotion. Why? Temporary because because everybody wants to be like us. Why? Because we're such big deals. No, you're not gonna. Be able oh to talk yeah. Either. Oh yeah. You want? No way. If enough of you register, Jimmy no. will do it. No. Mm -hmm. No. No. There we go. Challenge not yes. accepted. Yes. Oh, a victory accomplished. No. Yes. <laughs> Challenge not accepted. Yes. So yeah. Uh, also, Rejection big denied. thanks to Lagos. You want to head on over to lagos.com slash doctrine. Save yourself 10% if you're buying it uh, new. 25% if you are upgrading uh, to the new Lagos 8. You're not going to reach glory without Lagos. That's what Jimmy's saying. I wouldn't stop. say that, but that's what you said. Stop. No glory without Lagos. No, stop it. Mm -hmm. Purgatory. No, no, no glory cloud. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chris, we love you. Yeah, we love you, Chris. Uh, Fresh Pod every Monday and Thursday. Blog posts on Wednesdays. Video content coming back soon. Later. <laughs>